Well, you've got this new standard out, ASHRAE 90.1-2010. And look, take a quick look, and this is critical that you see this, because a lot of engineers are not aware of this yet. In fact, I would say most of you are not aware of this yet. This is a mandatory provision in ASHRAE 90.1-2010 that we're going to have to follow. And what is the center item A? Sensors shall either be located near the critical fixture. I hope I've talked to you where the critical fixture is. Is it the high point? Or logic located to do the same to simulate it being at the critical friction. Critical fixture. In other words, they would like for you to put the sensor up at the high point of the building, and you're going to run a hard wire all the way back to the pressure booster. I don't see anybody doing that. But that's what the mandatory provision says. Or logic that does the same. Item B. No device shall be installed directly on the pressure booster for reducing pressure. In other words, pressure reducing valves are dead. You can no longer legally put a pressure reducing valve on the discharge of a pressure booster. In my humble opinion, you just kill constant speed pressure boosters. You've got to go to verbal speed. If you don't, you're going to kill yourself. You can't do it any other way. You're now going to have to go to verbal speed. I say that kills constant speed pressure boosters. Item C. No booster cell system shall run and no flood. In other words, you're going to have to have a hydrodynamic tank. Can you make a pressure booster run without a hydrodynamic tank and cut off? Sure you can. But water's not compressible. So you've got a pressure booster and a hot tank, and you've got no hydrodynamic tank. When I go get a glass of water after you cut it off, it's going to cut back off. Crazy. You've got to have a hydrodynamic tank. That's what that means. Constant speed pressure boosters use using pressure reducing valves October the 18th, 2013. That's this year, ladies and gentlemen. Constant speed is dead. It is the law. I'm sorry. That's the message you better get. It's the law. You're not going to change it. Along with this message, I think you need to pick up on this. We're also saying to you, you don't want across the line constant speed bypasses on your verbal speed drives. If you put a cross-the-line constant speed bypass on your verbal speed drive and your verbal speed dies and you run at constant speed, you don't have a pressure reducing valve, you're going to blow fixtures off the wall. You can't do that anymore. So you want verbal speed drives, no across-the-line constant speed bypass because you do, you're going to get in trouble. That's the law. That's what's coming. So why is this happening? Why would DOE make such a ruling? Why would this be coming down the road? Very simple. Pressure boosters are oversized. We just went through all of that. You got these big showers, you got these fixture couch, you got the hunter curves. It's a guess. It's an estimate. Who knows what the real the real demand may be? We got hunter curve that we that we went in. Remember we had the 180 GPM get our demand. The hunter curve information came out of ASHRAE in 1967. It's old stuff. Nothing wrong with it. But it's very conservative. We're gonna have way too much water required. Do we have verbal head loss? Sure we do. We've got that five pounds of friction loss per 100 feet max. As we vary the flow, the friction loss varies. So that's why they want you to put it at the remote sensor. That's why they want you to control out there. So you can take advantage of that and run your pumps even slower. It will give you some numbers on that and give you a detailed example in just a few minutes. Pressure reducing valves. Yeah, pressure reducing valves and constant speed pumps work great but they take five to eight pounds of pressure just to put one on there. Five to eight pounds of pressure is a lot of KW, a lot of energy that we're wasting. So what did DOE do? What did Asher 90.1 2010 do? They are banned. You can no longer put them on a pressure booster. Do our loads change? Sure. There's a typical load profile of a complex. Look at here. In the morning, 12 a.m., the GPM is very low. Look at it peaks when it's about a, what, 225 GPM around 7 o'clock. Everybody's taking showers, kitchen's on, dishwasher's running, whatever. And at night it drops back down to about 20 GPM. So why would you run a pump constant speed, which has got to be sized to do this, peak demand at this time of day? So we certainly can take advantage of the flow changes in a typical load profile. And this is probably typical for your house. Do suction pressures change? Absolutely. Those of you who live in a city, we are paying attention to this. City water suction pressures change over a period of time. They will gradually uh, probably uh, go down, which is happening in a lot right now. They're actually deteriorating as they add on more and more demand. But in a typical situation, you've got this friction thing going on. So during the day, they will actually change. 
So let's take a quick look at, at, at a pressure booster situation that could be constant or variable and give you some ideas of why you have your sensor location, where you put your sensors, and why we're saying verbal speed is, is the way to go, that ash rate is correct. There's no other way to really make any good sense. Take a quick look at this. We've got a demand here of 400 GPM. You see the pressures involved on this. And the point I'm trying to get across to you, should that pressure booster be constant or should it be verbal? Which way do you think makes the most sense and why? So let's take a quick look at this. Now here's a verbal speed setup with a critical fixture at the top. Remember we said the critical fixture, the critical fixture would always be at the top. And Ashray is telling you it wants you to sense up here at the top that critical fixture and control the speed of the pressure booster from that critical fixture because they know that's the most efficient place we can run this variable speed at the lowest speed we can on the pressure booster to do this. Now the things you need to understand, look at this chart real quick, and we don't have a lot of time as usual, is in red up here we have 20 pounds of friction loss between the discharge of the pressure booster all the way to the top where that remote fixture is. So there's 20 pounds of friction loss. And real simple, you get this in your head real simple, that 20 pounds of friction loss only happens when? under a full flow of 400 GPM. So 400 GPM is the only time that we would have 20 pounds of friction loss, right? So if I'm at 200 GPM, this thing becomes what? Five pounds. If I'm at 100 GPM, this thing becomes what? One pound. If I'm down to 50 GPM on no flow, what is the friction loss? Zero. So by running and controlling the pressure booster from the remote sensor, I'm able to run slower because I can see that 20 pounds of friction loss. If I ran it from a local sensor on the discharge of the pressure booster, I always have to assume the 20 pounds is there because I can't see it. Now, at a high level, that's kind of what's happening here. kind of want you to understand that, making sure you got that in your head. Let's back up and make sure you understand if I put pressure reducing valves on this, how bad it would it be. And for you engineers in the audience, here's a, here's a typical little curve that kind of explains that to you. What am I trying to do? I've got 20 pounds of suction pressure. I'm trying to boost it 54 pounds. I've got a boost pressure I've got to maintain. So the solid black line across the top is the pressure I have to maintain to keep everybody happy. This little pink line is my efficiency curve. Across the blue line is my pump curve. If I'm constant speed, no PRV, excuse me, constant speed, no pressure, uh, no verbal speed pressure uh, drive alive, I'm using constant speed with a pressure reducing valve, in this case a 4-inch PRV valve. Everything in yellow is wasted energy. In other words, at small flows here, my pressure reducing valve is choking the pump down to maintain this uh, 74 pounds discharge pressure I've got to have. So everything in yellow is wasted energy. It's like driving a car with one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. It's stupid. Just plain stupid to do that. So for that reason, uh, DOE, ASHRAE has banned pressure reducing valves. You cannot do this anymore. You can't do that. So now we've got to have a verbal speed drive to hold that solid black line there, whatever pressure you want to maintain. So the yellow, they have banned the PRVs. They have banned because of all the energy that's been thrown away at that point. So I hope you understand now why constant speed PRVs are banned. They want to get rid of that. They want to get the system more efficient. So let's go back and take a look again a little bit at this pressure sensor location, which is the next tricky part that you've got to catch on. What should be the set point for your verbal speed pressure booster? What pressure are you trying to maintain? If you put your sensor at the critical fixture, and I think we've taught you where the critical fixture is. It's going to be at the high point, and you set that to be your minimum pressure for your set point, that becomes your residual pressure. And that's what ASHRAE, that's what ADOE is asking you to do. In this case, uh, 30 pounds. So I need 30 pounds at the high point to maintain that pressure at all times. So backing up again, looking at my chart, I'm saying if I look at a critical fixture at the top, I want to maintain the pressure at 30 pounds no matter what. I'm going to control my variable speed pressure boost accordingly to always maintain 30 pounds. Why would that be going on? What is the results of doing that versus taking the local pressure of here? If I had to go to the local pressure, then I've got to maintain what? 74 pounds all the time. 
because I can't see the 20. I only got one set point. So if I set this for 74 pounds, it works fine. But I don't have any visibility of the flow. I do not know what the flow rate is, and I cannot see this 20 pounds of friction loss that I want to get rid of because my pump will run slower. Let's give you a concrete example of that. Uh, it's kind of hard to see sometimes to understand it all, but let's just make sure you understand the numbers a little bit. If I had a remote sensor at 30 pounds versus a local sensor at 74, what happens to my speed change? We work math all day long, but this is what you come up with. If I use a local sensor right here, I get a 10 pounds speed reduction. If I use a remote sensor, I get a 26% speed reduction. Speed reduction local sensor, 10%. Speed reduction remote sensor, 26%. You saying, Chris, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but we're working with a cube here. You got a cube factor. If I can take it, take the RPM, I can cube it out to get my horsepower. So this becomes a huge difference in savings that we can apply. So here's a typical example, a little simple example. Two pumps, constant speed, very cheap energy, six cents a kilowatt hour, sixty-seven hundred dollars a year. I put two pumps in verbal speed with a local sensor. I save a lot of money. I save thirty-five hundred dollars. Great, I did a good job, and you did do a good job by going to verbal speed. This is why verbal speed versus constant speed is a no-brainer. You got to do it. You, you can't continue throwing that kind of money away. So you got to go to verbal speed. Period. But how about going from the local sensor to the remote sensor? That's the next piece that nobody's really doing right now. Why did DOE say you've got to go to the remote sensor? You saved another thousand dollars at six cents a kilowatt hour by simply changing the sensor location. And that's forever. Makes good sense to me. You start working the numbers out. By the way, uh, you start looking at codes and everybody around you. Here's Duke Power. Happens to be typical where we are. You can get a savings from Duke Power by energy rebate. They'll actually pay you to put a verbal speed drive in. You can get online and check this out. I think it's worth looking. Wherever you may be in the country, check your utilities out. They are paying you to put verbal speed drives in. Back to Asher 90.1 2010 to kind of wrap this up for you to make sure you got the message. DOE has said that by October the 18th, 2013, you have to put a code in place in every state that will equal ASHRAE 90.1 2010. If you don't want to do that, you can apply to an extension, but you've got to go ahead and begin to do it. Here's the mandatory provisions repeat of an earlier slide you saw impacting pressure boosters. You've got to have a remote sensor at the critical fixture or the logic that does the same. You can no longer use a pressure reducing valve, so what does that mean? Verbal speed is here to stay, and no booster, no booster shall run if there's no flow. So now you've got to have a hydrodynamic tank sized properly, and we gave you some ground lines for that, I hope. Bottom line is the law says what? The law is going to become per DOE, ASHA 90.1-2010. You're going to have to have remote sensors at the critical fixture of logic, and you're going to have to have a pressure booster to do it. I'm assuming you people on the phone here would like to not break the law. That's the message to you. That's the whole idea of the concept of what we're trying to do in this webinar is get you to understand the changes. Thank you for your time. It's been fun. I uh, appreciate it. If you've got any questions, send me an email or something. I'll be happy to try to respond to you. Have a great day.